Good evening and welcome to Columbia Law School. <laughs> My name is Michael Gerard. I'm uh, on the faculty here and I'm the director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, which is co-sponsoring this evening's program together with the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary, and the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Um, I'll talk uh, a little bit more later on, but for now I just wanted to say uh, that we are here to address the question of responsibility for climate change in multiple dimensions. Factual responsibility, political responsibility, legal responsibility, moral and ethical responsibility. Uh, we will do this also from several perspectives. We have two scientists, uh, two law professors, one historian, and one lawyer who works at a seminary and we will discuss the responsibility of various kinds of actors, corporations, nations, and individuals. By the time we adjourn at 9 p.m., I hope that all of us have a better understanding of the issues, the arguments, and the possibilities for future action. As we head toward the United Nations Climate Conference that starts in Paris uh, at the end of this month, some of us in person, more of us through electronic uh, media of all sorts, I hope that our discussion here tonight will yield a clearer conception of who should be looked to for what kinds of actions going forward. Uh, first, a word about our format. I'll introduce each speaker before he or she uh, gets up to talk. Uh, they'll then talk uh, for about 12 minutes each. Uh, then I'll um, uh, ask some questions and try to start a dialogue among the panelists. Um, uh, because we have limited time and there are a lot of people here tonight, we're asking anyone uh, in the audience who has a question to write it on one of the three by five cards that have been left on each desk. Toward the end of their prepared remarks, our people will go up and down the aisle collecting cards, and they'll continue to do that until we are near adjournment. I'll select uh, questions to read aloud, and I reserve the right to combine or paraphrase questions as appropriate. I want to gratefully acknowledge the support of the David Sive Memorial Fund in putting on tonight's program. Uh, the program is being videotaped, and we will post a link uh, to the video on uh, the website of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. You can also uh, go onto that site to sign up for our blog and Facebook and, uh, and Twitter accounts and, and keep in touch. That's www.columbiaclimatelaw.com. Uh, let me also say that uh, we're having um, uh, another speaker coming in on climate issues. I'm going to mention uh, a little later in my own remarks the um, so far successful lawsuit in the Netherlands on uh, climate change. The lawyer who um, uh, largely behind uh, that case, Roger Cox, is going to be here on November 19th um, uh, giving a talk at 12.15 p.m. next door in room 103, if any of you are interested in coming to that. Our first speaker this evening is Peter Frumhoff. He's the Director of Science and Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists and Chief Scientist of the UCS Climate Campaign. A global uh, change ecologist, Dr. Frumhoff has published and lectured widely on topics including uh, climate change impacts, climate science and policy, tropical forest conservation and management, and biological diversity. He was a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, 2007 Fourth Assessment Report and the 2000 IPCC uh, Special Report on Land Use, Land Use Change, and Forestry. And he served as chair of the 2007 Northeast Climate Impacts Assessment. He's on the Advisory Committee on Climate Change and Natural Resource Science at the U.S. Department of the Interior, on the board of the American Wind Wildlife Institute, and, uh, and several other organizations. Previously, he's taught at um, Stanford, Tufts, Harvard, and the University of Maryland. So please join me in welcoming Peter Frumhoff. Thank you, Michael. Welcome, everybody. And thanks especially to Columbia Law School uh, for hosting uh, this, uh, this event. It's great to see you all here. Um, let me just move to my, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Um, so I'm going to set the table. Um, 
a little bit for the presentations to follow and then focus a little bit on the particular responsibilities of industrial carbon producers, fossil fuel companies. I want to just remind us where we are with respect to the trajectory of emissions and the impacts that will have on climate change. This is a representation of the rise, the historic rise in those black dots of, um, uh, uh, of carbon dioxide emissions, the primary heat trapping gas. Um, and you can see that we are following the highest of the um, trajectories that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uses to project uh, what kinds of temperatures we may see depending on the future pathway of emissions. We're slightly above that red line, which if we continue to follow, it will bring us to somewhere on the order of five degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, and in order to stay below the two degree target that was established in Copenhagen in 2009, um, a science-based target intended to limit the disruption of climate change, we'd need to be following uh, something on, on the order of that lower, that lowest pathway, the, the blue pathway, and you can see we're nowhere near that uh, today. So we're going to talk about responsibility, and, 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 and we can certainly think about the responsibilities of individuals. I know Michael Vandenberg will be speaking about individual responsibilities in uh, uh, terms of the ways in which the differences in those trajectories, the, the choices we make as a society, uh, will play out. What's the role of, of those of us in the individual choices we make? Um, in Paris, of course, the focus of the conversation will be on the responsibilities of nations, and appropriately so. And embedded in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change from its beginning is the notion that nations have common but differentiated responsibilities. And exactly what that means is um, undefined in the Framework Convention, and countries are wrestling with that today uh, and continue to wrestle with it in terms of what it means for different countries to take on, for example, emissions reductions targets. Science can inform that dialogue, but it can't determine it. Uh, and so this is one representation of a, a scientific representation of the way in which we might think about national responsibilities. This is the cumulative historic emissions um, of carbon dioxide from all major sources, fossil fuels and cement and land use, the top 12 nations. And, and it just points out that nations differ, not surprisingly, and that the U.S. cumulatively has produced the greatest uh, carbon dioxide emissions, followed by China, which is actually a little higher um, than it's shown here because of the news you may have seen today about the underestimates of China's coal production. Um, but this, again, science is a useful tool but not a determinative one for how to think about responsibilities among nations. But I want to focus my remarks on the distinctive responsibilities of fossil fuel companies, the companies at the base of the carbon supply chain that produce the coal, oil, and natural gas that are primarily driving, um, whose emissions are primarily driving climate change. And, and uh, of course, there's a lot of discussion about these companies, and the, particularly the investor-owned companies in the context of divestment and, and shareholder resolutions. It's a very important and timely topic, uh, certainly on college campuses, including Columbia. My interest in this really was triggered by some science that a colleague of mine and also of Naomi's um, uh, did a couple of years ago, a guy named Rikidi, who did this painstaking body of work where he went back through dusty library shelves and other resources and identified the amount of coal, oil, and natural gas extracted from the ground on an annual basis by individual fossil energy companies dating back to the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Calculated that all up cumulatively, and he found that uh, a, a relatively small number of companies, just 90 companies, um, had products which were responsible for just about two-thirds of all of the industrial emissions of carbon dioxide and methane. So the, the blue uh, on this graph is the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide and methane from industrial sources uh, totally. And the red is the total that can be attributed to the emission source to just these top 90 companies. And well, again, that's not determinative. It does point out that a, a relatively small number of companies have produced the products that have had a very large impact on our atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. But of course, it's not just the science that tells us what their responsibilities might be. Naomi and I and Rick wrote a paper this, that came out this past summer that, that pointed out that w one thing that's really important is to understand what companies did, particularly investor-owned companies, in light of the evidence of the risks of their products. And of course, we've known in the scientific community that carbon dioxide and methane have had heat trapping properties and that their increases would drive climate change for many decades, uh, reporting it to policymakers really since the 1960s. Um, uh, but the news of the risks of climate change really hit the front page, in this case of the New York Times, uh, in 1988 when Jim Hansen testified before Congress 
uh, that the evidence that, uh, was, uh, was available that global warming wasn't just a proposed future risk, but had already begun. Uh, this was a time in which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed when really a bipartisan sense of the issue uh, was, un, un, was not denied. Uh, Vice President George Bush ran for president at that time, pointing out that uh, he was going to fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. Um, it was a moment in which really there was a broad public uh, uh, perception that this was an issue. Um, but what do we know about the companies? Many of you probably have seen the news of the meticulous investigative reporting from really two major sources, Inside Climate News, a nonprofit, um, and, as well as uh, students uh, and, and colleagues here at the Columbia School of Journalism published in the Los Angeles Times, that at least one company, Exxon, um, had scientists, it's not really terribly surprising, working on the evidence of climate change, understanding the risks of, uh, of the emissions from uh, Exxon's products as early as 1977 and sharing that information with company executives and arguing that the company should take a proactive role in addressing the risks of their products. But of course, we know from a range of sources, including Naomi Rescue's uh, book on Merchants of Doubt and a report that uh, my organization, UCS, Union of Concerned Scientists, produced this summer, that companies did exactly the opposite. That really, once the news hit the public stage in 1988, 1989, um, uh, Exxon and other major uh, investor-owned companies began uh, to invest in sowing doubt uh, about the risks of their products and seeking to avoid and limit regulation. And there's a broad, broad range of evidence. I don't have time to go into it uh, in great detail, but just to point you uh, to one case. This is an uh, internal memo uh, from the American Petroleum Institute from 1998, a time in which the U.S. was wrestling with whether and how to respond to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, this was a communications memo. API, uh, an organization, the trade association for most of the major oil and gas companies, um, in which um, they highlighted their communication strategy, that victory will be achieved, for example, when average citizens understand or recognize uncertainties in climate science, that those uncertainties will become part of the conventional wisdom, and so on. And there was a long and significant effort by Exxon and others and their trade associations to sow doubt about the risks of their products. That is, they understood those risks. They knew them well, they had technological understanding of them, and yet they sought to sow doubt about those risks in the public mind to avoid regulation. Well, it didn't have to be that way, and not every company followed that path, at least not initially. So this is Lord Brown, John Brown, who was the, uh, in the late 90s, was the CEO of, of British Petroleum, which temporarily in the late 90s at a speech that he gave at Stanford, um, rebranded itself as Beyond Petroleum. Some of you may remember that in which he recognized and accepted the risks of climate change as highlighted by the IPCC and said, and I quote, we have a responsibility to act, and BP accepts that responsibility. And for a time, BP began to act like a more responsible energy company, investing in renewables, reducing the emissions from its operations, and so on. But that was short-lived, even though most of the companies today, including Exxon, highlight on their website um, that they accept the risks of their products. So this is Exxon's statement that rising greenhouse gas emissions pose significant risks to society and ecosystems. Hard to argue with that. Um, but at the same time, even today, most of the major fossil energy companies, the investor-owned companies, certainly the United States, um, continue to partner with trade associations and lobbying groups who sow doubt and disinformation. This just represents their participation as of last year with the American Petroleum Institute the Western States Petroleum Association, and the American Legislative Exchange Council. I don't have time to go into the details of each of these institutions and what they do, but just to point out, here's Alex's um, representation of the risks of climate change on its website. Climate change is a historical phenomenon, and the debate will continue on the significance of natural and anthropogenic contributions, kind of a Stephen Colbert truthy statement. Um, uh, and Alec spends its time, among other things, um, briefing U.S. state legislators on the lack of evidence on the risks of climate change and encouraging them through model legislation to repeal, for example, state renew renewable electricity standards. So these companies are working through partners to continue to sow doubt and to push back on policy. Well, companies also represent what they think the future of emissions will look like. And so I want to share with you a couple of projections. This is just the measure of historic emissions of carbon from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, this is the trajectory consistent with what I showed you earlier of the pathway that we'd need to be on uh, 
if we were to stay below the two degree target. Well, this is looking through 2035. This is the projection that BP makes of what the future emissions from fossil fuels will be. Shell puts out a couple of different options for you to choose from. And this is Exxon's. Now, all of them project that we'll continue to burn fossil fuels at a rate uh, that will bring us well above the two degree target. And they may well be right. Right? It's hard to know where we're going to end up. It's a big lift to stay below two degrees. But the important thing is that they're not disinterested parties. This is their business plan. This is what they project. This is what they anticipate. This is what they seek. Um, and so I would argue, and really our paper concludes, that companies continue to, through their political advocacy and through their business models to invest in outcomes that will lead us inexorably to a dangerously warming world. Um, but companies, society, I would say, can, can take actions to encourage companies to be more responsible. They may be legal actions, but they're also civil society actions I want to point to. We can think about what criteria we might use. What would a responsible company look like? I want to just lay out a couple. You can choose if you like these or not. I'll just suggest that it might include, should include, that companies should stop supporting disinformation, that they should unequivocally support sensible climate policies, that they should reduce the carbon content of their fuels, for example, by reducing in low carbon energy technology and reducing the emissions across the life cycle of their products. And I would argue also that they should, we should expect them to pay a fair share of the cost of climate damage and adaptation that we would not be facing had they taken more responsible measures uh, once they knew of the risks of their products. I want to just very quickly point out things that can happen and that are happening with respect to these. So I'm going to point out a couple of things. On the point of stopping support disinformation, um, we've worked, UCS has worked over the past year with two of these companies, BP and Shell, with both senior executives and in a variety of different ways to encourage them to understand the difference between what they're saying, that, they, that climate change is real and needs to be addressed, and the actions of the American Legislative Exchange Council, which they have been partnering with for many years. Um, and so we've done a variety of activities including social media activities to point out um, that Shell, for example, uh, uh, was continuing to fund an organization that was uh, continuing to support skepticism. Um, and again, I don't have time for details, but I'm happy to report uh, that over the past several months, and most recently by Shell, um, both companies have left the American Legislative Exchange Council due to the kind of social pressure, civil society pressure, that we and our colleagues have put forward to them. And so companies are social actors, and they have a social license to operate. And as society and as society players, we can help revoke them. I want to just close, thank you very much, on a different point, which is about the question of paying the fair share of climate damage and adaptation costs. What does that look like? So um, just to give you an example, this is from a study in New York by um, uh, Scott Culp and colleagues at Climate Central, an organization based at Princeton, um, where they looked at the damage from uh, Hurricane Sandy. The blue is the damage of Sandy um, uh, uh, from uh, 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 storm surge. Uh, and the red is the damage that was additional because of the additional storm surge that resulted from sea level rise. So they've parsed out the difference between what would have happened and what happened because of anthropogenic emissions and, and the consequence with sea level rise and higher storm surges. And they've calculated that sea level rise added about $2 billion uh, of damages to Sandy's toll. That's about $100 per person in the city of New York. One can ask the question, who should pay those costs? Should taxpayers alone pay the cost of those damages? And is there a responsibility among companies to begin to pay some of those costs as well? A challenging issue to make operational, but nonetheless, I think, an important conversation uh, to have. And I want to just close by pointing out that science can also help inform that. So this is from Rikiti's study showing the amount of emissions traced back to individual companies. Um, and science, with work that we're doing and other colleagues, is beginning to translate those emissions into changes in climate. This is the amount of, this is from a paper that's forthcoming on the amount of increase in global temperature that can be traced to Chevron, ExxonMobil, Saudi Aramco, and other companies. And over the coming months, we'll be able to demonstrate that we can trace, for example, how much of that sea level rise 
can be traced to emissions sourced to individual companies and other kinds of climate damages. Our hope is that this will serve as a discussion platform and perhaps a policy platform for beginning to think about damage and the responsibility of companies to pay for it. And I just want to close with this New Yorker cartoon since we're in New York. Um, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. This, this is not the place we want to be, um, and I'm eager to hear from my colleagues about opportunities to make sure we don't end up there. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Naomi Oreskes. Uh, she is professor of the history of science and affiliated professor of earth and environmental sciences at Harvard University. She's the author of numerous books, articles, and opinion pieces. Uh, you've already uh, seen reference to Merchants of Doubt, which was shortlisted on the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and released as a documentary film by the same name in 2015, which we showed here a few weeks ago and uh, also The Collapse of Western Civilization, uh, both co-authored with Eric Conway. Uh, she also wrote the introduction to the Melville House edition of the, papical, of the papal encyclical on climate change and inequality, uh, and co-edited Science and Technology in the Global Cold War. She has won numerous prizes and awards, including most recently the 2014 American Geophysical Union Presidential Citation for Science and Society, and the 2015 Herbert Fees Prize of the American Historical Association for her contributions to public history. Naomi Oreskes. Well, thanks, Mike. It's great to be here, and uh, really a pleasure to be with all these wonderful colleagues. I see that in transferring my slides from Mac to PC, some words got cut off, but I do know what my first name is, so hopefully this will all work out <laughs> fine. Um, so I want to talk about the issue of personal responsibility. I've given a lot of lectures around the country, and one of the questions that often comes up when people begin to talk about divestment or litigation, the res there's often a lot of resistance to those ideas, and often that resistance takes the form of a focus on the question of individual responsibility. People often say to me, well, we chose to use fossil fuels. ExxonMobil was just giving us the energy that we needed, wanted, asked for. Responsibility is, of course, tied up with the notion of free choice. Uh, philosophers, theologians, and ordinary people would all say that we're responsible for our actions, assuming that we were not forced or coerced into them. Indeed, I would go farther and say that free choice is a central ideal of American culture. And it's tied in our culture to tropes of freedom, individualism, manhood, and the romance of the frontier. So it's not surprising that the tobacco industry drew on these images and these tropes in order to promote tobacco. In fact, those of you know who anyth anything about the history of tobacco know that one of the primary defenses that the tobacco industry used about its product was to say, well, this is a personal choice. And then to promote images like the Marlboro Man, who, by the way, did die of cancer, Actually, there were several Marlboro men who died of cancer. Uh, they had to keep getting new ones because they kept dying. Um, but I especially love this camel ad, one of a kind, although I don't know what that man is wearing because he looks really <laughs> weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also not surprising that climate change deniers attempt to liken themselves to Galileo, presenting themselves as heroic individualists. Individual choice is also central to the discourse of free market capitalism that has dominated American the American conversation for the past 40 years. So just to give you one example of this, when Ronald Reagan described how he understood what it meant to have a free market, and the year is 1984, which I think is significant. Um, it's amazing how many of these things happened in 1984. Uh, he described free market capitalism as a system in what, quote, millions of individuals making their own decisions in the marketplace who will always allocate resources better than any centralized government planning process. And of course, it's also central to the philosophy and the ideology of Ayn Rand, who's been so influential in American conservative thinking in the 20th century, including influencing such important people as Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan. And Rand, Ayn Rand famously wrote, throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads, 
armed with nothing but their own vision and cigarettes. <laughs> And of course, it's also a central trope of the Americans for Prosperity and the resurgent Tea Party m movement, and here they are um, with the famous flag of the American Revolution, don't tread on me, right? Invoking notions of individual freedom, responsibility, and kind of throwing off the shackles of unfair governance. So I think it's really important for us to think through this question of the role of thinking about individualism, the sort of valorization of the heroic individual in American culture, because I think if we are going to make a case for climate responsibility, we will need to address and to some extent dislodge some of these values and assumptions. And indeed, in tobacco litigation, that was one of the things that people had to do. So how are some of the ways we might think about dislodging it? Well, the central argument that any sociologist or historian would make is that we don't make free choices. We make choices that are influenced and structured in many different ways. They're influenced by advertising, by marketing, by fads, fashion, sentiment, and various forms of irrationality. And of course, one of the reasons we have so much marketing and advertisement is because it works. Our choices are also structured by availability. Society makes some choices much more available than others. So for example, oh, and infrastructure, of course, makes certain choices effectively unavailable. So I had the great privilege when I moved to Massachusetts two years ago of seeing Paul Revere riding down Massachusetts Avenue the other day, which I thought was very fun. But I don't actually have the choice to ride a horse to work. There's no place to put the horse when I get there, no water, no feed, and I think I would be fine if my horse left his poop on the Harvard campus, or certainly my dean would complain. The infrastructure we live in was not the result of millions of Americans making free choices every day. It was the result of conscious and planned decisions by centralized government and centralized corporations. So just to give a couple of examples, the decision in the 1950s by President Dwight Eisenhower to build an interstate highway system, rather than, for example, a national rail system or nothing at all. Another example, the decision by the US government to develop civilian nuclear power which was not promoted by the private sector, but by the US government as part of Adams for Peace, uh, driven by international geopolitical concerns, and to indemnify the industry under the Price-Anderson Act, so that if there were major accidents, the government would back this industry up, and to take on the obligations and costs of nuclear waste disposal. So none of that was done by millions of Americans making free individual choices. And of course, energy and infrastructure, energy and the infrastructure that supports it has never been a free market. In fact, energy markets are arguably among the least free of the markets of our world. And similarly, smoking is not a free choice if you're addicted. Indeed, if you became a smoker not knowing that it was addictive because the industry lied about the facts, then you were denied to make the right to a free choice. Another area we might think about is the whole realm of competing interests, which is an important area of law, philosophy, and other things. Obviously, sometimes my choices compete with yours. And in civil society, we restrict choices that hurt other people. I don't have the choice to kill you. So should I have this choice to sell a product that will? And how come I can't sell heroin, but I can sell tobacco? A third important thing to think about is information. Adam Smith's vision of an efficiently functioning free market relied on the assumption that people had not just good information, but perfect information. But we can't make good decisions without good information. And the more our information departs from the ideal, the less well the market will function, and the worse our choices will be. And I think this is one of the key aspects of the recent revelations about ExxonMobil that Peter Fumhoff just referred to. ExxonMobil, we now know, acted with great organization, great intention, and spent a lot of money to ensure that the information we had about climate change was not the information that the scientific community was trying to communicate to us. Then there's the question of external costs, and this relates to information as well. An efficiently functioning free market requires that the cost we pay is the true cost for goods and services. In other words, that that price signal is conveying accurate information about what things really cost. But we don't pay the true cost of fossil fuels because we don't pay the external costs, the health and environmental damage caused by mining, drilling, and use of these fuels. Indeed, the International Monetary Fund, Fund recently issued a report in which they estimated that in the year 2015, the world will subsidize fossil fuel use to the tune of $5.3 trillion, 
mostly in unpaid external costs. About 700 billion of that is direct subsidies, and the remaining trillions are all indirect subsidies through unpaid external costs. Finally, the other issue I'd like to point out is that many of the key advances of the 20th century did not come from individuals armed with nothing but their own vision, but again, really came from a very different, the truth, the reality of the history is nothing like individuals armed with nothing but their own vision. And one of the most obvious places where this is true is in the area of public health. I pulled this off uh, Google Creative Commons and I thought, wow, this is really good. I don't know who made it, so whoever it is, thank you. Um, 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century, and here they are. Not a one of these was produced by the free market, and we didn't choose to control infectious disease as individuals. We chose collectively as a society to fund the Centers for Dece Disease Control and all the different state public health organizations that helped to develop vaccines and distribute them to <coughs> millions, hundreds of millions of Americans around the country. And of course, the same is true of technological innovation. A little while ago, Eric Conway and I started making a list of all the important technological innovations in American history that were not the result of the private sector or individual initiative, but were the result of either the government or government private par public partnerships. And the list got so long that we couldn't fit them all on a slide without the font getting too long to read. So maybe I should actually do that for effect, but they always say you should never have slides that people can't read. So here are just some examples, radio, telephone, rural electrification, aviation, the interstate highways, nuclear power, digital computing, the internet, GPS. I mean, all of these were largely developed by uh, the government either in a leading or very strong supporting role. The reality, as every historian and lawyer knows, is that we routinely accept interventions in the marketplace where necessary to remedy market failures, level playing fields, prevent fraud, or protect people, particularly innocent and vulnerable people, from other people or from the abuses of the private sector. And I recently did a little research just to think about how far back does regulation go. And one of the earliest laws you can find, 1819, the UK Cotton Factories Regulation Act. Um, anybody know what that? Act did, it forced factories to have windows, mm -hmm. and it also made them make sure that their uh, workers went to religious services at least uh, once a month. <laughs> <laughs> Some Americans would probably like to reinstate that aspect of this law. And it also forbade child labor under the age of nine. <laughs> so regulation is, is almost as old as capitalism, actually. Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. By the late 18th century, there were already big arguments taking place about whether or not there should be government interventions. By 1819, uh, we get the UK Cotton Factories Regulation Act. So, oh, and I want to just add one more thing. When first proposed, every single one of these laws was opposed by at least some people as unfair restraints on trade or inappropriate uh, interventions in the marketplace or inappropriate restrictions on personal freedom, or in some cases, inappropriate interference in the right to contracts. So contract law gets pulled into a lot of this as well. But the reality is that free choice is an idealization. We have always had rules, regulations, and laws to manage people's behavior, particularly in the marketplace. These are choices based on balancing competing interests and concerns. And they're our choices as, and our choices